Joining us now is Ojinika Ukpe with stories trending around the world. Hello, Jinx. Ojinika. Ojinika. <laughs> Happy Friday. That's your name. <laughs> it is. How are you? I'm good. Good morning, I'm Dr. Vati. Good yeah. morning, Tim How are you? I'm this great. Morning. How are you? I'm doing excellent. You know how I get on Fridays. Mm. Happy. <laughs> We're missing Rufai today. Well, good morning to you, viewers. Here are some of the stories that are trending across the globe. In the United Kingdom, an artwork titled The Love is in the Bin by British street artist Bansky that sensationally self-shredded just after it sold at auction three years ago fetched a record-breaking 18.5 million pounds at Sotheby's in London on Thursday. The artwork sold for three times the high estimate. In the United States, NASA is set to launch a series of spacecraft to visit and even bash some of the solar system's most enticing space rocks, starting with a robotic trailblazer named Lucy. The spacecraft will be blasting off this weekend on a 12-year cruise to swarms of asteroids near Jupiter. While China is preparing to send three astronauts to leave on its space station for six months, it will be China's longest crewed space mission and sets the record for the most time spent in space by Chinese astronauts. The Shenzhou 13 spaceship is expected to be launched into space on a Long March 2F rocket on October 16. In Nigeria, the Chief of Defense Staff, Loki Irabo, confirmed the death of Abu Musad al-Bawani, the leader of the jihadist group, the Islamic State West Africa province, and the son of the founder of the Boko Haram militant group, Mohamed Yusuf, who was killed in police custody in 2009. I can authoritatively confirm to you that um, um, Abanawi is dead. As simple as that. He's dead and remains dead. Under sports, NBA All-Star Brooklyn Nets guard Kyrie Irving on Thursday defended his decision not to get vaccinated against COVID-19 as what's best for him after team officials announced on October 12th that he will not be allowed to practice or play a Nets game without getting inoculated. The 29-year-old could lose more than $17 million in pay for games that would have been played in New York. Finally, under entertainment, a Los Angeles artist, Lily Bernard, on Thursday filed a sexual assault lawsuit against actor Bill Cosby over a 1990 hotel room encounter in Atlantic City, New Jersey. The 57-year-old artist says Cosby drugged and raped her in a hotel room after promising to mentor her on his top-ranked TV show. She was 26 years old at the time. Well, let's begin what's trending in Nigeria. In light of the current Twitter ban and the apparent clampdown of the freedom of press and information by the Nigerian government, an old video has resurfaced showing the chairman and editor-in-chief of This Day Arise Media Group, Ndukao Baigwena, addressing the Senate on the role of the media. Let's take a look. Mr. Chairman, the leadership, um, Ndukao Baigwena, and I represent the media. I would not like to add to a number of things that have been said here today and in the last few weeks, except to refresh our memories on some salient points. First, in whatever arrangements that we're trying to do, we must continue to remember that freedom of the press, freedom of information, are central to any democratic being. I must point out that a number of people mistake freedom of the press or freedom of information to mean freedom for journalists. It is not often the case. Quite often, many of you in government see the press as your enemies. But soon after you leave power, you run to us for help. I'll give an example. 
I was a guest of Franco Menka's security group and Al Mustafa's actions, and I went on exile. Soon after I came back, one early morning in my kitchen was Franco Menka. What was he looking for? He said, please help me, but my uncle want to kill me. He was out of power. And I asked him, if you had killed the press, will he be coming to us to help you? So it's important that we all realize that to build our new democracy and to hold our leaders accountable, we have to enshrine and on our bridgeable freedom of the press and access to information on our government. Now that was a powerful speech. Uh, Dr. Abati, this was 16 years ago at Obasanjo's uh, political conference in 2005. I mean, this is what we're still facing now. We are still talking about the freedom of press and freedom of information. Yes, March 2005, yeah. um, shortly after the president addressed that uh, national political reform right. conference that was chaired by Justice Nikki Toby. After the initial disagreement over the mode of the debate, yes. the uh, conference then began to respond to some of the issues raised uh, by the president in his opening speech. And there you have uh, Mr. Bagmena. Uh, drawing attention to something very important about press freedom, about freedom of expression, yes. about freedom of information. Many years later, under President Jonathan, the Jonathan, uh, President Jonathan was signed into law, the Freedom of Information Act. And one of the major things about that Freedom of Information Act is that, look, the Freedom of Information Act is not for journalists. It's not the freedom of journalists. It's the freedom of society itself running an open society that is based on transparency and accountability, and that, you know, the freedom of expression, freedom of uh, information regime uh, applies to every citizen. And Mr. Bagmina was making the point about the adversarial relationship between uh, the press and uh, institutions of government, which has been the case, by the way, since 1859, because the Nigerian press is a crusading uh, press. And so it is very easy for persons in authority uh, who have the ambition of uh, compromising the state, of collecting rent, to be very friendly with journalists. At a point in this country, we were referred to as press boys until it became clear to everybody that the boys have become men. And uh, we also have uh, institutions, you know, within the media. So that was an excellent point. Another point that was made in that, uh, you know, uh, opening uh, contribution by uh, Mr. Bagbena then, was the issue about debt, the debt burden. Mm. Because at the time, some people were saying, look, don't go and use Nigerian money to come and pay uh, uh, any kind of debt. But of course, his advice was that, why don't you adopt the Argentinian model, whereby you sit at the table and you work out a far more you know, workable way in which Nigeria can relate with the international system. And then, of course, constitution. He talked about they called for a referendum. He said, well, he didn't object to it, but if you are calling for a referendum, can we do it in an inclusive manner, whereby you carry all the elements uh, you know, within the Federation along? So those issues were relevant in 2005. They're still there right. today. They're still very correct. However, the big thing about that uh, Nikitobi uh, conference is that it was uh, aborted about a year later over controversies about the third term agenda. Books have been written on this. People thought that despite the serious issues about resource control, about constitution making that were put on the table by that conference, that there was an attempt by certain elements uh, within the system, even on the floor of the conference in the National Assembly, uh, to perpetuate unconstitutionally you know, the tenure of uh, then President Olusha Gombasanjo. But of course, President Obasanjo till tomorrow continues to deny any involvement. But lately, we've seen even more revelations about some of the key actors in that debate. But Nigerians refuse that, you know, nobody can change the constitution uh, for the purpose of, uh, you know, violating it. So well these said. are some of the lessons, I think. Well said, Dr. Vati. Tundra Viola, your analysis on this topic? Plus Sashan, plus Salaman shows. 
is exactly what I'm thinking here. <laughs> it's so sad how we just do not make any progress. This is why this year the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to, to journalists, journalists yes. because it's such a dangerous occupation. Uh, Chairman, Mr. Wagner, there referred euphemistically as being a guest of Franco Menka and um, Al Mustafa. He was not a guest. Those were very scary people. Those were the henchmen of the Abacha Junta. And Franco Menka, I believe, was a, in the Directorate of Military Intelligence in Apapa. Most people who went there never came out alive. Where is James Bagauda Kauto? I remember him when I listened to things like that and what we have been through as a country and what we continue to experience as a country with media being gagged, yes. people being penalized, people being hounded, prosecuted for telling the truth. Another, well, you focused just on the freedom yes, of press, but you extended the conversation. Look at Argentina that Mr. Albabiana mentioned. How many times have they defaulted on loans? That also continues to reoccur in that country. So Nigeria is not the only country that's stuck in this kind of sick hamster wheel, this kind of Sisyphean endeavor where you roll the rock and it rolls right back down. We're just not making any progress. And you also mentioned the referendum. Yes. Are there no calls for that still going on till today, becoming more deafening by the second? Where is the progress? After all these years. Well, you asked after the uh, victims of uh, military brutality at the time. I think you should also ask the question, where is Franco Menka himself? I don't because care where Franco Menka these is, persons, frankly. These persons who get onto the stage and who get carried away, you know, they often forget that power is transient. Of course. And you that may was be the, the, uh, the what is that quote again? Well. The uh, cock yes. on the wall yeah. today, but uh, tomorrow you are just like a small fly Absolutely. out there, completely powerless. Absolutely. I'm more concerned well with the victims, including those whose bodies were never recovered. This is the evil that we endured really in this country. Really sad. We'll take another story. Reactions are trailing the argument made by Fakaye Olufemi, a member of the House of Representatives, who on Wednesday said owners of small and medium-sized enterprises, including carpenters and taxi drivers, should be made to pay tax because they make a lot of money. Oluremi was contributing to the 2022 budget debate, and during plenary session, he said their tax contributions would enable the federal government boost its revenue generation. Let's take some reactions. Well, this is from African nationalists who wrote, since Africa's government are not getting the full financial benefits from the resources that are privatized under IMF loans policy, taxing the masses will gradually become the next means of revenue for the government to add to the peanuts gotten from Western dollar loans. Everyone has to work for the nation. Well, Ade Reti wrote, there is no crime in taxing every citizen, but people will always invade tax because they have not been enjoying the benefit of tax government is collecting from them. The so-called rep can't produce 10 years of tax clearance if we ask him to produce it. Sundra Biola, your take on this story. Well, I don't know about that allegation. Yeah. That's yes. really beside the point here. But for me, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Because yes. there's supposed to be a social contract. You, the taxpayer, you pay your taxes and you get the dividends of your taxes, the good roads, the health care that's provided, the education and what have you. The federal government, even state governments, will claim that they're not able to provide all these things because our tax bracket is so narrow. Most of us who pay taxes are just a minority in this country. People in the informal sector have not been captured. So in order to really you know, provide the kind of services that we expect, they should broaden it. Everybody should pay taxes. But the taxpayer will argue that those of us who do pay taxes, what do we have to show for the taxes that we pay? Well, what kind of service? So who point, should yes. blink first? Should the services be provided? Should we be shown that there's now a level of trust? And then we'll now be happy to part with our tax naira. I think that's the way it should go. This is why people are suspicious and don't want to pay their taxes, don't want to be captured in the, in the bracket. However, what are the options? Because I personally, I'll speak for myself, I rail against borrowing, I really do. But what are the options? What are the options to borrowing? It's just taxation yeah, is one of the major options to borrowing. Correct. But no, nobody wants to do it. In the UK, we all talk about the NHS, which for me is the best health system in the world. But they pay 45% yeah. of their salary at ta as tax. Okay, that's people that earn over 150000 pounds. Less than that, you pay 40% of your salary as tax. Yeah. Which one of us wants to part with 40% of our salary? And yeah. what we complain. So it's yeah. a catch-22. But the major issue is that small and medium-sized enterprises are not supposed to pay company tax, correct? Well, that's the position in uh, the Finance Act right. 2020 as passed by the uh, National Assembly. 
And the whole idea is to encourage, encourage small and medium scale mm -hmm. enterprises. In other words, if you run a business under the purview of that law, uh, that does not make up to 25 million naira yes, per annum, then you are exempted from taxation. But the bigger issue is the fact about government revenue. When governments uh, talk about revenue, they're talking about uh, taxation, they're talking about getting revenue, they're talking about collective responsibility, uh, they're talking about you owning the governance uh, process. But the big problem with taxation is that point about taxation without representation is tyranny. So when people pay tax, they want to see what you have done with a, uh, with a tax. This is one of the remote causes of the American uh, Revolution. Yes. The Stamp, the Stamp Duty Act of uh, 1765, uh, right? I think it's 65. Yes. yes. You know, the people, the uh, colonists, you know, in the, in the U.S., they, they said, no, Britain cannot be taking tax when the people are not represented, when there was no accountability. And we have a similar situation here in Nigeria. Nobody wants to pay tax. What's that uh, book again? The Taxman Comment. Was that uh, Eugene O'Neill? Anyway, there's a book Even like the that. rich, no right. one wants to so pay tax. So nobody wants to pay tax. They either want to evade it, yeah. they either want to uh, avoid it, yeah. you know, uh, completely. But here in Nigeria, we've had problems with taxation since the colonial times. Sure. Almost as a genetic uh, habit, you know, the average Nigerian will run away. People used to run into the bush, <laughs> away from uh, the British colonialists looking for, for tax. And after the co uh, British colonialists left, even under this dispensation, people still don't want to pay tax no. if they can avoid it. So this gentleman is past talking about this issue of collective responsibility. Uh, and he says these people make a lot of money. Uh, they should pay tax. Well, does he himself pay tax? That's the question. You That's know, a lot. And <laughs> that was the he, he didn't social look media. at the other yeah. side of right. it. What is done with the tax in a society where the average man thinks, oh, even if we pay this tax, you know, the money will be stolen anyway because right. there's corruption in government. He cannot see good roads. He doesn't have regular electricity. So there isn't that moral obligation mm. uh, to live up to that civic responsibility. So that's the main problem that we have here. That said, however, Nigerians still pay a lot of tax. Mm. It may be indirect tax, but they still pay a lot of tax, whether they are taxi drivers or they are carpenters. If you don't have electricity, you go and buy a generator. Even if it is, uh, right. I better pass my neighbor. They're paying tax. <laughs> Local government it's, officials it's, are all it's, over the road harassing these same outrageous. taxi drivers outrageous. that that gentleman outrageous. is talking about. Yeah. If you are a carpenter, in fact, for carrying uh, uh, your tools, you could be accused of carrying uh, dangerous weapons. The, the policeman will, will take money from you. So the Nigerians bread. live yeah. in a very problematic yeah. environment. Yes, widen the tax base. That's an intelligent point to make. But how do you manage tax so that the people themselves can buy into it and see it as important? Government only talks about revenue. They don't talk about, you know, responsibility well often. Said. Well said, Dr. Batting. Let's take another story. It's a video of a self-proclaimed pastor named Arinze who was caught after defiling a girl in Anambra State. Arinze says he was told by a chief priest to collect the girl's blood so that his church may prosper. Let's take a look. Uh, my fellow CDA people, you guys are coming late. This man, his name is uh, Arizi. This Arizi came to my tenant's place about three weeks ago, Abby. The first time he came, he said he was looking for a house. So my tenant was trying to help, her, help him to get the house. They could not get house or shop. They say it's too expensive for them. But even though if they bought that land, well, they must refund them. We don't want such church in this environment. Church is for God. This man now came. He went to the tenant to my tenant's place. So my tenant gave him food. He had the food, so he was playing there. Maybe he used spiritual means or something. My tenant face has slept. He slept off. By the time he woke up, he saw the one of his of our guests. Blood was dripping from her vagina. The only thing we knew was that the girl was defiled. And blood, he said he collected blood from the girl's vagina. Now he, now, he took it to where they want to use him to do church, so that his church will boom. Why will you use spiritual, the devilish means to get people for God? God did not send you this one. So, as it is now, 
Have I lied? Did I lie to my narration? Eh? Talk now. Did I lie? I was so annoyed. Tundu Abiola, I can see tears in your eyes. I'm sorry. I, maybe I should wait uh, and take Dr. Bati's comment first, and then we can talk. But I was so horrified watching this video. This is what these men do to young girls. Why are young girls always the victim here? Well, you know, uh, this is one of the reasons why there are persons either in the National Assembly or outside of the National Assembly who have been uh, recommending the death penalty for any form of rape or defilement of minors or sexual uh, you know, violation. And the laws are there from the Child Rights Act to the uh, Violence Against Persons uh, Prohibition Act you know, in states where the, that particular law has been domesticated. And the criminal code is also very clear in several sections about you know, what you do to people like this. And it's sad that it happens again and again in our society, in various parts of our society. The second leg of it, of course, is that the man is hiding under religion. Yes. We were yes. told that he, got, uh, he rented a, a portion of land yes. where he's proposing to set up a church. So within the community, you would naturally assume that, oh, if this person uh, is running a church, he's a man of God. This is the kind of contradiction that you'll find. He's been unveiled now. He's talking about chief priest, asking him to bring the blood, you know, of a young, uh, uh, you know, uh, virgin, a young girl. And then he violates, you know, the child of another person, you know, puts a scar on that person uh, for life. So maybe those who are recommending stiffer penalties, yes. maybe they are right. Maybe the time has come you know, for us to take a look at those penalties. And also uh, to take a look particularly, uh, a second look at those sections of the law dealing with rape, both in the criminal code and under the, uh, uh, and the relevant portions of the Evidence Act, you know, and even the definition of rape itself. I hope that the man is, uh, you know, Locked committed up. to justice Where? and that justice is done in this particular case and that opportunities are provided for counseling particularly for the uh, parents of the child uh, that has been defiled. And we hope that he will, he will be handed over or that he has been handed over to the police. Because, yes, the citizen action, you can apprehend an offender, but, you know, you, you cannot, you are not allowed under the law uh, to resort to jungle justice. Right. And I hope that, you know, there will be no jungle justice here and that he would uh, face the full weight of the law. Absolutely. Well said, Dr. Bati. Tundu. I'm completely horrified. I'm sorry. That poor girl. What we have to keep me? talking about these th what, topics. What bail me? It is so outrageous that we have no protection. Okay. And do you know what he did? He went to this house where he found the girl and drugged the parents before you know, defiling the young girl. It is so unacceptable, really. Oh. And in the name of religion, really. And that's probably why the parents would have let yes. this kind of a creature into yes. their house in the yes. first case. Yes, yes. We have to continue to raise awareness for this type of topic. Really sorry. Shall we take our final story with this inspirational video of 92-year-old Ewi Rosvik von Korf, who is one of the most successful rally drivers from Sweden. She won a number of European championships and was the first driver to prove that women could win a Grand Prix. Let's take a look. November 4, 1962. The Argentinian Grand Prix begins. One of the world's toughest races, attracting the world's toughest men. Only 43 drivers made it to the end. And one of those drivers made it his stupid. The first driver to finish three hours before everyone. And the first driver to prove women could win the Grand Prix. Me, Evi Ruskvist. They say I could never finish. So I finish first. As a woman, Tundra Biola, 
and she made history. We have to continue to protect our girls so they could become as prominent and successful as Eri, really. And she's 92, Thank you she's for still that alive. Video. I had to do that. She's amazing. What I an Amazon. She's still alive and what she's in an Sweden. I am so impressed by her. Dr. Abati. Yes, I mean, the Grand Prix since she started, yeah. or if you like, the World Championships yeah. for drivers, uh, since she started in 1950, had always attracted women. At yes. least in each event, there will be about five female drivers who will show interest. But it, it wasn't always often that some of them made it uh, to the main race uh, itself. But, you know, this piece of uh, history is very useful mm -hmm. and it's good for uh, purposes of women empowerment. Yes. Maybe a day will come when, uh, you know, the, the uh, championship will even be dominated by more women yes. uh, than we have ever seen beyond what may look at the moment as uh, a male-driven sport yeah. and tokenism with regard to gender representation. Yeah, right. Well, Thank well, you, Eugene. That's all I have for Thanks, you on Eugene. What's Trending. Have Thank a good you, weekend. Thank you. That's all I have on What's Trending today. I'll see you tomorrow or next week. <laughs> <laughs>